we're going to be talking about remote team technologies. These are tools that we can use to support the work of our virtual or remote team. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a sort of just a brief introduction and talk about a couple topics about these, uh, these virtual technologies and then go through some of the specific virtual tools that you can use and, and give you some advice on those based on my experience with them. And then finally, I want to talk about this idea of when technology fails. So let's start with some opening considerations. And, and the first thing that I want to say is, is that virtual tools don't replace non-virtual tools. They reshape the working environment. And, and this is what I mean by that is let's say that your traditional background is working in a team and uh, a co-located team. So a team where you meet together most of the time in a conference room or in a hallway or at the water cooler or lunch or whatever the case may be. These virtual technologies that we're going to talk about, they don't simply replace. You don't remove working uh, from a co-located, say, working in a conference room and move that meeting to an online and everything stay the same. It just doesn't. Now, I'm not saying it's not very similar. It is, but it's different. And the difference is something that we should take into account. It needs. It's something that we should think intentionally about because it reshapes the relationships that we're going to have. It reshapes the kind of um, the way that we get along with people, it reshapes what we can get away with saying if, if we're a sarcastic person and uh, we sort of have that sort of witty humor. That stuff does not translate very well to conference calls or to emails, even though it may be just fine in a meeting where people can sort of read your body language and, and pick up that, uh, that that's just sort of your wit or your humor. So it really these tools reshape the way that we work together in many ways. So we need to go into using them, if you will, with our eyes wide open, realizing that they're going to change the dynamics. Now, it's, it's not that the environment is going to be unrecognizable to you, but, but that it is going to change the dynamics in a significant way, and that needs to be taken into consideration. I'm, I'm putting them more positively here, but building trust where there's room for criticism, there's a, a commitment, there's accountability, there's attention to results. Whenever we're after these types of things, the way that we get at them is going to be different in a virtual team sometimes than in a traditional co-located team. It, here's a real simple example. In a lot of the teams that I've worked with, one way that you can surprisingly build trust with people um, is you can joke with them. Um, not joke at their expense, but just sort of joke with them, sort of find something in common, find some humor in it. And that just has an odd way of building trust in people when you find a place that something that you can laugh with them about. Well, oftentimes you don't have that opportunity or if you try to take that opportunity in a remote environment and it doesn't connect because there's that disconnect through the virtual world, then what you can actually do is create distrust and not trust. So you can create the opposite of, of what you want to create. Criticism's the same. Um, with criticism, what you might be able to say to someone in person and they'll be able to accept that in a way that they know you're after the idea, not after them, it may not come across that way um, in a virtual environment. And so we, we have to really think carefully about how we use these tools. We do not need to go um, from one to the other, from the co-located to the virtual, from the um, direct to the remote, without taking these things into consideration. Another simple example of this is many times you have people that are very quiet in meetings. That's just the, the way that they, they are. They don't say a lot in meetings until they you know really have something to say and oftentimes that's fine because people in the room can sense their body language they see that they're engaged maybe they're taking notes maybe um, it, it's obvious that that even though they're not saying a lot they're fully engaged well that doesn't really translate well into a virtual environment because if you're quiet on a call people are, are they paying bills they may wonder are they checking their email are they playing solitaire what are they doing and so 
you oftentimes, if you're, if you tend not to be a very verbal person, then you might want to step that up a little bit in a virtual meeting um, so that people know that you're engaged. They know that you're committed uh, to the process. So, so these are just sort of some opening general considerations that, that I want you to think about. And the key here is, is what you've done traditionally in, potentially, what you've done traditionally in your uh, traditional meetings, face-to-face, -face, may not translate directly into the virtual world. And so you need to think about that. You need to uh, be intentional about the way that you engage using these technologies that, that we're going to talk about. I'm just going to overview some of these and, and give you my thoughts. Talk about collaboration tools, project management tools, document storage, sharing tools, meeting tools, document co-creation tools, and meeting scheduling tools. Now, some of these, um, these aren't neat categories. Let me say that. There's overlap between some of these. Collaboration tools have project management tools. Project management tools have collaboration tools, have meeting tools. So these think of these not as discrete categories, but think of them sort of as a, as a continuum, as, as broad categories where there is quite a bit of, of overlap. So let's start with collaboration tools. Really what's unique about collaboration tools is they try to put many features within one system. So that can include things like task lists, file management, discussion boards, video chat. Any of these things can be within a single system. Um, what differentiate these from, say, project management tools is oftentimes, although they have task lists and they may create a, a very simplistic schedule, the goal isn't so much to drive project work as it is to replace what exists when you get together in a conference room of, of some kind in a more traditional set, setting. You're, you'll find that these kinds of tools are great for simple projects with well-defined or a simple scope, but they're not really going to be standalone in terms of managing a more complex project. They just don't have the robustness, particularly in the scheduling and in the resource management area of, of really being able to identify and track the scope in a detailed way. At best, you may get two levels in a task list, oftentimes not the complexity needed to fully decompose the scope of a project as we would traditionally do with a work breakdown structure of some kind. So the, these have great tools um, and um, can be used for many things, but they're not standalone in more complex projects. So some project management tools. Now, these are specifically designed to support most aspects of managing a project. They may be light or collaboration type tools maybe non-existent in, in terms of things like video chat or file sharing or document co-creation, things of, of that nature. Now, MS Project is the most accessible, I, I think, um, project management tool. And if you're using the server version of it, it has very good or fairly good, depending on what your scale is, integration with, with SharePoint. So for sharing schedules for viewing them and and getting into details on the project it works fairly well there are some other virtual ones such as basecamp and a lot of these are again they're fine they're on the scale between collaboration tools and project management tools and they tend more towards the collaboration tools with essentially more rigorous or glorified to-do lists. Um, they really lack the rigorous scheduling features that you're going to find with something like MS Project or Primavera or, or any of the other main project management tools. However, for many projects, they're going to be just fine. Oftentimes, you can get a free account once you get over a certain number of users, or you want to use the mobile app, then there's a subscription feature for most of these. You can create a free account with Basecamp and take a look at it to get an idea of one that's, that's fairly accessible and very popular. Uh, there's a lot of features, but again, if you're looking for something that's, that's going to need a little bit more rigorous scheduling features, uh, something like this would typically not support it in the same way that something like MS Project would. 
but again, is a fairly good tool to use. Now, document sharing tools, we, we're all familiar with these. Dropbox, uh, Google Docs, OneDrive, all of these are things that we can use to essentially store documents and, and share them, link to them, and, and that, that type of thing. What's nice about these is that you can allow for authority levels for administrative rights, read-only, and those different types of things. Oftentimes what happens though is that you'll have an account linked with a um, email address and if you're using this for personal and professional or for multiple projects, oftentimes it can get somewhat confusing, especially if you're not the greatest at creating directories and organizing things well within it. So be careful with these. Try to create a good system for, um, for managing the directory within these or files can be very difficult to find at times. But again, these are great tools for easy, quick sharing of docs among team members and, and some of them have um, features that, uh, that you can use for collaborating on docs such as Google Docs and OneDrive does. So virtual meeting tools, things like WebEx, Google Hangout, GoToMeeting, these are great tools for quick video and audio call, calls. Most of them integrate screen sharing and document sharing into these as well. So um, I've used WebEx quite a bit and Google Hangout, GoToMeeting some. All of them are fine. They basically, at least with WebEx and GoToMeeting, typically do the same thing. Google Hangout's less robust, but uh, a great tool that's, that's free to use for video and, and audio chat. So good tools to use. I'm sure you're using some of those um, even now in collaborating at work and in the class. Now, with co-document creation tools, this is essentially where you create a single document that you can have multiple authors working on and, and oftentimes simultaneously. Google Docs, Prezi is more for presentations, great for collaborating on a document. One nice thing is, is that uh, Google Docs specifically creates an audit trail of changes and updates so that you know what changes were made, when they were made, and you can look at different versions of the document. Excellent tool for that purpose. There are some formatting issues when converting to MS Word or um, some other formats, so just take that into consideration because if you don't, then you may be surprised what your document looks like. What I find most often is best to do is to export it as a PDF, and that way what you see is what you get. Meeting scheduling tools, these are tools that are designed to essentially find uh, meeting coordination. What is a time when everyone can meet? Doodle, TimeBridge, it's a simple survey tool that just finds out when people are available and identify convenient meeting times. Now. This is a pretty big list of a bunch of different tools, and the question is, do you have to use you know, 10 different things to accomplish working, to, working together? And the answer is, is, is oftentimes, no. Usually you'll find a couple, such as a good collaboration tool that allows for, for file sharing, meetings, um, uh, and, and maybe some basic to-do list, and then maybe something like MS Project using um, SharePoint that's got a little bit more um, robust scheduling tools if, if that's important to you. So what to use? Well it depends. It depends on the complexity of the project. For projects that tend to be more complex some of these tools just simply won't work. It's not that they have don't features that won't be helpful but certain aspects of them just aren't going to be able to handle the complexity of a project. So play around with them and find one that's going to work for the complexity level that you're working at. It, it also depends on the technical savvy of your team members. Um, that really can influence and, and it is, I'm sure you've already discovered this working together. You, know, you need to plan the first 15 minutes of your first virtual meeting with a piece of technology just to figure out how to use it to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Don't assume that everyone's um, computers are at the same level of updates, that Java's working and all those the mics are working, oh, it's just all those things that are so horrible to manage are things that you have to take into account. So be prepared to deal with that. And then the availability of technology. Um, you may find one that's perfect, but your company won't support it by paying for enough licenses. There's all sorts of issues. 
um, that, that can come into play here. So it really depends upon a number of factors that honestly you're just going to have to sort of muddle your way through in most circumstances until you find one, prove it, and then use it um, into the future. And then you can look at the constraints of the project. Some projects may have documentation or oversights requirements through a PMO or, or some other thing that mandates what technology you can use. Or there might be an outside source such as a government body that uh, requires you to use certain levels of encryption, encryption for certain documentation. And some of these pieces of, of um, some of these tools that we've talked about would not support that. So you need to be careful uh, what you use. Look at the these different aspects. <clears throat> to determine what you think is going to be best. So finally, I want to talk about when technology fails. And I'm not talking about the kind of failure that you think. We just talked about that failure. Someone's mic doesn't work. It's timing out, wh whatever the case may be. Sometimes technology doesn't allow us to connect in the way that we, we hope. Um, and I, I don't mean connect on the utilitarian way of can you hear me now, but it, it doesn't allow us to connect in that, that human way. And, and all technologies have costs. Whenever we switch from one to the other, we're, maybe we're gaining something, but we're giving something up as well. And just let me give you a very simple example of this, and it's a smartphone. Um, smartphones were sold to us, and when I say us, I mean humanity, as... Um, this great device that's allow us going is, is going to stay connected. And it's sold to businesses as a productivity device, meaning I can get my email here, I can meet with people, I can review documents, all from a smartphone. And it, it's a great benefit to the, um, the company, but it comes at great personal cost because we're always accessible. Um, People know that you have your phone. They know that most often you see an email within 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes max, and oftentimes within minutes of them sending it. And so it creates this expectation of them responding. And so whenever you select a technology to use for your virtual team, just don't think about what's it going to do for me in terms of the benefit, but think about what types of costs is this going to create? Um, and, and for you, I, I don't know what that is, but, but you know, just, just try to think about not simply what it's giving, but what it's taking away. And, <clears throat> and that sort of somewhat ties into this last point. Sometimes we don't know what made us successful until we change what we think didn't make us successful. So um, let me just share a story with you, a, a story that I heard this past week. Um, in a radio show on NPR, and it's about the um, Vaina Sausage Company. And uh, you may know this story, but they're, they're located in Chicago. And, and as the story goes, the company was located in South Chicago and started out in a small manufacturing place back in the early 20th century. And over time, they continued to buy buildings on this block in South Chicago, and, and they would sort of connect them together in this hodgepodge sort of way, whatever would work, and so what you ended up was a factory that was connected and worked and produced what became a very um, successful product, w whether you like the sausage or not, sausages or not, or have ever had them, I have no idea, but, but they were very successful, and so, but it really was a, like a, a rat maze you know, the production process, where things were, where the freezers were, where the smokers were, where packaging was. And, and so to move things through was quite cumbersome. And so I believe it was in the 70s they built a new facility um, up on the north side of Chicago. And at the time it was state of the art, you know, all stainless steel, all, only the best materials. And so they got everything moved in that, into that new production facility and started running their batches of producing the Vienna sausages, and they weren't right. The color was wrong. Instead of them being, uh, you know, like this dark pink, almost a red, they were a light pink, and the flavor wasn't quite right. Even though they were using the same recipe and, um, and doing everything the exactly the same way, and so they went on this year and a half to two year search to find out what was different. Why aren't they the same as when we made them at the old production facility? 
And so as the story goes, they were one night, some of the old timers were hanging out at a, a bar after work and, and chatting about it and, and trying to figure it out. And they were talking about old times back at the old plant in South Chicago. And, and they were talking about this, this one guy, and I can't remember his name, so we'll just call him John. Uh, John's job was to take the sausages from after they had been packed and prepared for the smoker to take them from the freezer to the smoker and how that he would have to go through this this pathway that would take you know I don't know 20 30 minutes something to walk them over and how that you know now thankfully they don't have to do that they go straight from the freezer or straight from the refrigeration area right into the smoker and it clicked in someone's head someone's head what difference did that make? Because during that time that this guy John was making the trip in the old plant, the sausages were heating up. He was going past the boiler room. He was going through these different areas of the plant to where that the, the temperature of these was actually rising um, between the time that they left the refrigeration area and the time they went to the smoker area. And so what they did is, um, at the new plant is they built a new room to simulate that walk that John would take to deliver the sausages to the smoker. And when they did, when they built that room, the color came back and the flavor came back. And it, it, it's an interesting story because they thought that by moving in and taking on all the new technology and, and all the new things was going to make them more successful. And in the end, it may. But in doing so, something they didn't know that made their product successful was changed. And until they found what that was, they couldn't replicate it. And so as we move to more virtual, more remote teams, which I'm, I'm all for, we need to think about what's lost potentially when we do that. Because many times people passing each other in the hallway and kicking ideas around is lost whenever we move to a more virtual environment. And so we need to think carefully because oftentimes, yes, technology creates opportunities for us to be more efficient. But oftentimes in our search for efficiency, we lose what makes us effective and impactful. And so that's one of the reasons I, I, I entitled this slide or this presentation Virtual uh, Water Coolers and Copy Rooms and whatnot because we lose those sort of incidental, incidental opportunities to bump in and chat with people and, and, and sort of bad ideas around whenever we move to a purely virtual environment. And so we need to look for ways to recreate that. Um, and it's not easy to do so. Oftentimes it feels faked. Whenever we say, well, let's talk about ourselves a little bit in this meeting over the telephone, it's, it's awkward, but we need to find ways to connect with people. We need to find ways to create those opportunities for exchanges because oftentimes ideas are generated, innovations take place in those side conversations when people that are struggling with separate issues come together and they talk about those struggles and they discover they're struggling with the same thing or they're struggling with different sides of the same coin. And so... Don't forget what technology can cost us and try to take that into account in managing and ordering your virtual teams. And hopefully, hopefully, we won't lose those things that made us successful to begin with and that we'll be able to lead successful virtual teams.